So, like we said, that there's there's a couple different ways that we can do number nine. We can write it two different summation forms. Okay. Um, let's jump right into a, a problem where we find the area under the curve unless there's something that you have a question like about just the notation or in general or, or a homework problem that comes before the area problems. Yeah. You have a question about. Yeah? Um, can we do 17? Good question, Logan. Not a great grade, but I was like 20 or 400 off. Okay, so just to remind you, everybody, um, let's see. Oh, no, So remember, we're trying to get it so that we have uh, the summation notation with just a, a constant, just an i, just an i squared, and just an i to the third. So we have these formulas that we can apply. Okay, so let's go back to here and write down the problem. 17. All right, we're going to go from the first, let's say rectangle, the first term to the 20th one. Okay, and. Okay, well, we can't really do that here yet because, like, everything's inside of this parentheses squared. So, uh, if you remember the properties of summation notation, we have to have like a sum or a difference or maybe something multiplied together. But we don't have that. So, what ideas do you have? Multiply it out. Multiply it out, distribute it. I squared, that's not I squared. Mm -hmm. I squared minus two I plus one. Okay, so now we can separate these out, have uh, three different sums for this one and this one and this one. Let's see if this might be faster. Maybe I'll go over here. Three different sums squared. We can put the minus in front because it's really using the constant multiple rule. We can really actually put the negative two in front. And one right there. Any questions about that? What I just did? No. 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 Everybody's good. Yep. Holly. Mm -hmm. Been in Disneyland World. I know. I'm. I'm getting back into the math. You're good. Here, you know? Okay. Uh, she told me she hated this class when she was done. All the time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so we have a formula for the first 20 squares, okay? Because right? this would be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 5 squared. on that's 20 squared. That's what I say. It's the sum of the first 20 squares. It's not factorial. The formula for uh, for the first 20 squares would be 20 times 20 plus 1 times 40 plus 1 over 6. Am I right? Did I do this right? Let's yeah, I think so. Here it is. Yeah? N times N plus 1 times 2N plus 1, so that's 20 plus 1 and 40 plus 1 over 6. We're good to go. Okay, so that's the formula for that one, okay, so then minus two times, this guy right here is just n times n plus one over two, so that's 20 times 21 over two, okay, two's mm -hmm. canceled, okay, now, plus, what are we adding up here? We're adding one, plus 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 one. how many twenties, or how many ones are we gonna add up? Nine. 20, of them, 20 plus itself, or one plus itself 20 times, it's just 
20. So it's this guy times this, whatever. Just adding up 20 on those ones, or whatever that is. Let's see. Uh, we got 20, 21, 41. The 6 is going to cancel with the 20 a little bit. We get the 10, 3. Ooh, 21 and 3. Cancel that over here. Factor of 7. We got 20 times 7 times 41. What? Oh, okay. Four ten. Seven. Two ninety-eight oh seven. What? Twenty-eight seventy. Seventy. Oh shoot. Twenty-eight seventy, not oh seven. Um, minus twenty times twenty-one. Four hundred twenty. Seventy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I should have remembered. Yeah. Four hundred twenty. Four hundred twenty. Sorry. Uh, plus twenty. Negative 400 to 2,870 minus 400, 2,470. Yeah. We... Oh. Yes, we did. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes. See? <coughs> yeah. No, I... <laughs> I just did the first part, 2,870, because I just... And then I was just like, you know, well, that doesn't make sense. Okay. So I was confused. Oh. But you were doing it right, and then you just gave up. That's what you're no, your story. no. Um, I didn't factor them out. Right. What do you mean factor them out? Well, like, all I did was I squared. Oh. Like, I went from the I minus 2 squared. 1. Yeah. I minus 1 squared. I squared minus 1. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't do the 1, I did minus 20. And then, yeah, so it was just bad from the beginning. E for after, bud. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> should we jump into an area problem? Sure. Okay. How many of you watched the example that I stayed and gave up my lunch to work out? No one? Great. Aaron? Good. At least one person did. That makes it worth it. That's a bigger insult. You just said he fell asleep. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bigger insult than not watching it. Um, okay, let's, let's talk about 31, I guess, this, to, before we get into that. Okay, so this is the sum as a function of n. Okay, so as n changes, the sum will change. This isn't just exactly some area area problem yet, but our, our area problems will end up looking a lot like this. Okay. Uh, we can plug in one, we can plug in two, we can plug in three, we can do all that kind of stuff. But we want to find the limit of this as n goes to infinity. So we want to find the limit as n goes to infinity of this. Any educated guesses? Yes. Well, isn't the second part the formula for I to be? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it is. I mean, it has relevance because we'll probably see that come up in our, in our work for, for areas, but uh, otherwise, it's also relevant. Um, we just want to let n go to infinity, right? Because our sums, or our areas, uh, we're treating as the sums of lots of rectangles and an infinite number of rectangles, and n represents the number of rectangles. Right? Yes. 81. Why do you say that? Because it's going to be 81. If you do the top part, if you end of the do fourth, it, if you multiply it out, <laughs> multiply it out. <laughs> and I'll just power the end of the fourth. It'll be, we'll have an 81 times n to the fourth something, something, something. Yeah. yeah. You don't know what the rest is? No. It doesn't it matter? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Just, Why doesn't it matter? Because it'll all be nothing when that number's so big. Yes. n to the fourth will be so big that this will be 
nothing. And so we'll distribute the 81 and, and we'll distribute to the end of the fourth and all that other stuff. And what we'll wind up with is 81 end of the fourth, over end of the fourth, fourth, fourth something, end of something, fourth. something over four end of the fourth. And the end of the fourth. So this is the only term that matters in the numerator. This is really the only term that matters in the denominator when we're talking about n being so big. So we're going to get a ratio of, a, of a, that approaches 81 over 4. So that is the limit. That's what approaches, 81 over 4. Okay. So remember, comparing the degrees of the numerator and denominator, that's a big part of it. Let's find what I hope to be a simple area problem. Um, start with 50. Okay, x squared plus 1, what's that thing? What is that? Parabola. That is up or down? Up. Opening up. Okay, and what about that plus one? Shift it up one. You guys are awesome. I'm a great teacher. Here we go. Fact. That's not recording. You gotta record facts sometimes. Okay, and so what this is asking us to do is find the area under the curve, meaning between the curve and the x axis. Assume that means. Okay. So find the area under the curve between the, the curve and the x-axis. All right. Yep. We're going to write this out. I do not want you to reduce this to a set of steps. I would like you always to like explain oh. this stuff to yourself over and over and over every time you do this problem. So that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to treat the problem. All right. So how did we start all this? How did, how did we start to approximate the area under the curve? Rectangles. Rectangles. Drew rectangles, we, we, uh, we found the heights and the widths of all those rectangles, we added up all the areas, right? That's going to lead to some interesting variation of stuff. Uh, we get another color so we can see this rectangle. Here's a representative rectangle. Uh, we add up all the rectangles from the first one to the nth one. Okay. Here's the first one, it's right here, the nth one is the last one. Um, so we want to find the, the height, uh, find a way, like a formula, for finding the height of this rectangle and the width of this re rectangle, or the, the delta x, this, this rectangle, the change in x that we're going to use. So how will we, given that we're on the ith rectangle, find the height of that rectangle? Again, it'll be the function. What? If y is three, no. It'll be the function x squared plus one. This is from x equals zero to x equals three. Yeah. From here to there. A plus three minus zero n. What is that? For what? For the height. For the height. A minus b minus a over n times i. A plus. A plus. A plus. Yeah. That's the formula for finding the height. Yeah. What? Oh, so yeah. what's this? Plug in for the x. Yeah. How does that relate to the rectangle? That's position of what rectangle it is in. Position? Yeah. I'm asking, what does this tell us about the rectangle? The height. This does. That point? Yeah. Which point? Which corner? Right, right, right bottom. Right bottom corner. Okay. It tells us where that is. Yeah. Right. Let's let's piece out why that is. Why this tells us that. Okay. Go ahead. A is the point of the bottom of that rectangle, right? A is. A is. 
bottom of, of this rectangle? Yeah, the green one. Is that what A is? A is, a is your left, your, your lower limit, is what we'll call it. Huh? How, how do you say a semi-added label was like X and then there's like a line? X, X of I? X of I? Uh huh. That's what it is. Yeah. It is X sub I. The X that is the right side of the rectangle. Uh, okay, so A is your lower, what we call the lower limit of something that I'll tell you later. The lower limit is the left side of the, the, the region that you want to find the area of. Right? Okay. So that's our starting point. Right? A meaning right there, that's A, the left side. Okay. Well, why is that? I mean, then we're going to start adding stuff on. Why is that? We're going to start at A, the left side, then add. Why are we adding? Because you're going to go to the right. You're going to go to the right. Find the, you know, the rectangles are going to be to the right of A. We're going to go to the right of A to find the rectangle. Okay. Um, so what does this mean? B minus A. Right. We, what's B? Right. 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 Of the whole space. Of the whole space, the right side of the space. Yeah. A is the right. left side of the space, which we said. So if you do B minus A, what does that give us? The whole width of the whole space. Yes, exactly. And if we, what's N? The number exactly. Number of rectangles. What? Number of rectangles. Number of rectangles. Not this rectangle, right? But the number of total rectangles. Yep. Yeah. And then, so if we take the width and divide it by the number of rectangles that we're going to use, and we squeeze it into that width, what does that give us? One rectangle. one rectangle, and we'll assume that we'll let all the rectangles be the same width, because there's actually this, if you think about it technically, the rectangles don't have to all be the same width, right? Because once we let them go to infinity, even if this one started out to be a little bit wider than this one, they'll both be so skinny because they're so scrunched in there that it won't really matter if you use the same width. But we'll assume we use the same width because that's a lot easier. B minus A over N will be the, the width of one rectangle. That'll be like the rule for finding the width. Um, so what will I get if I, if I take 0, which is A, plus 3, which is B, minus 0, which is A, over N, like that. What will that give me? It'll give you 3 over N. What is that? Width of a single, rec single rectangle. And if I, if I use that as my X value, like where am I? At the very beginning? Yeah, and then you multiply it by the i and you can learn why. Yeah, i is which one you're on, because no i. Oh, OK, so what was i then, right here? i is which rectangle you're on. Well, I mean, what was i that, when I wrote this down, what did I use for i? One. 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 So where am I with 3 over n? First rectangle. The first rectangle. It's the biggest rectangle. It's what? One yeah, one rectangle over, right? And if I use 2 here, so it has 6 over n, where's that? Second rectangle. Second rectangle. And whatever n is, depending on what n is, like the specific place, uh, that depends on n. Okay, good. So we multiply by i because i like changes with each rectangle. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. Rectangle. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, that's what this is. That's how this finds x sub i. x sub i. Can somebody like define what x sub i is? This is the width of the rectangle? That is which rectangle you're on, isn't it? This is which rectangle you're on. This is the number of the rectangle that you're currently finding the height of. What is, so what is x sub i? The left corner or the right corner of that rectangle? The x coordinate of the right side of that, the ith rectangle. Okay? Uh, so we'll say right side of the rectangle. Okay. okay. So this is the right side of the rectangle. 
So what? What are you doing with that? I said earlier, Kevin? Huh? Plug that into the function, so that's why I said with f in front of it, right? Okay. Um, so we put that into the function. We're just taking an x value for the location on the right side of the rectangle. We're putting it into the function. When you put an x value into the function, what does that tell you? It tells you the y, right? That's what functions do. It goes back to the very basic idea of what a function is. You put something in for x, it tells you what y is. For us, y represents right, the height of the rectangle. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so uh, let's find this for us, for this problem. Zero plus uh, three minus zero over n times i, okay? We call this x of i, we call this delta x. So we're gonna put this into the function, so we're gonna take uh, really three over n times i, if you simplify all that down. 3 over n times i to the second power plus 1, right? So now this expression will give me the height of any rectangle, whichever rectangle I choose. The first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, whatever, uh, as long as I choose how many rectangles I want to use. Okay. So that's the height. What else do we need to find the area of a rectangle? Width. The width. The width we call delta x. Rectangle. We already have delta x, right? The delta x is a tiny little change in x, like how much we're going to scoop over each change in x as we move over to the next rectangle. So what is that? 3 over n. 3 over n. 3 over n tells us the width of the given rectangle. If there's a thousand rectangles, one rectangle will be 3 one thousandths. Yes? Yes. Okay. We're getting it. And we multiply these together. So we'll put zero the whole thing and multiply the height by the width. We're ready to go. Uh, and we'll take this. I'm going to put it on the next page. We've taken the area problem, we've uh, let it become just a, a, a summation, and we have formulas to simplify. But when we get all done, and we, we use our formulas, how many rectangles do we want to use? Infinity. infinity. So we let n go to infinity. So we need to use all the formulas and stuff to get it to the point where we can let n go to infinity, compare the degrees of the numerator and the denominator. And uh, you know the magic. Okay, so let's work on this. Let's parse this out. We're just using those properties and formulas. However, we can bring three n out front. Three over n yeah. out front. Okay, why is that? It's a constant. Yeah. It's a constant multiple. Yes. It's multiplying everything by a constant. We know that we can bring out constant multiples. Yes. Because remember, now n looks like a variable, doesn't it? It doesn't seem like a constant. Can someone explain to me why it's a constant? If it's what? The number that you put like on top of the sigma and sign, that would make it a constant. Okay. Well, it is, yeah, it is a constant. It is just a number, right? Yeah. Well, when the i's are, there's no i in it, and i is what's going to be changing. Uh -huh. n is always the same, so it's a constant. And it's like outside of what i is going to be. Okay, good. It is, it is a multiple of this whole thing, yeah. so you can bring those constant multiples out here, and n just represents the number of rectangles. Like, we just have to decide what the number of rectangles is, and then it'll always be the same. i is the thing that changes. Okay, uh, so we have three, but how about if we just call it 9 over n squared, i squared, plus 1, can we do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Square that parentheses, 
square that fraction there. <coughs> okay, now what can we do? Divide or n squared also, I think we have. Oh, yeah, split them up. Yeah, we've got to split them up. So we'll split this into two sums. So we'll still take the limit n, which is infinity of. Uh, Uh, all right, let's see if that makes this faster if I just wasted a bunch of time. Okay, we're going to have some this guy here, because we could split up these sums wherever there's, you know, that addition or subtraction. Um, so there's that part plus. Because now we have used the formulas to turn summation notation into like an expression that actually would find the sum. Alrighty. So how are we going to let the end, the limit of n go to infinity? That's the question. So that's the part that we that we struggle with. We're not sure about. What's that? Plug the infinity in right now. What's that? Bring n to the numerator. That way, it's not zero. Into the numerator? No. I think I would do with h. It's a little bit of a different idea. Yeah. Here, let's do this. But like, if we had, we we did a, a problem before. This one, like. Once we had a single fraction, then we were able to evaluate it. Okay? So, hey. Oh, here it is. So, how about if we distribute this 3 over n in there and then we'll get like this fraction plus this fraction? Right? Okay. The difficulty comes in we have fractions times fractions. We're trying to figure out what would 3 over infinity times. Like infinity, because this this would be a an 18n cubed something 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 up on the numerator, and this would be a 6n squared, and so this would go to infinity, but this would go to zero. So it's zero times infinity. Does zero win or does infinity win? Right? Is a zero a smaller zero than infinity is a big infinity? Like that's a that's a weird question. Thing, so. so let's multiply these together and see what happens. Uh, We'll multiply this in, distribute this in, we'll get uh, 27 over n cubed, uh, let's call it, times n times n plus 1 times 2 n plus 1. I guess I should have put a 6 right there. 6 n cubed in the denominator. And then we'll distribute the 3 over n to here. We get uh, 3 n over n. This one's simple. We can just cancel out the n's, so that would just be 3. Uh, 
This one? Yeah, if it's just three, wouldn't it just kind of like go away? Well, you have to make copies. No, because n's not it, like, it doesn't affect this three. So it's this three is just three. Okay. And n can't make it go away by changing, right? What would go away is three over n. Now n goes to infinity, divides three by a huge number n. So now it comes down to which degree is larger, right? Which degree would be larger, the denominator or the numerator? It'd be the same one. Yeah. Could you multiply all this out? Could you what? Right, so when we distribute all these together, right, if we distribute, say, these two together, we get 2n squared, whatever, whatever. We don't care about the whatever really because we're talking about the degrees, the biggest power of x, or n in this case. So in the end, we'll wind up with 27 times 2 n cubed, 54 n cubed, and other stuff. Right. And we have 6 n cubed down here. We put the dot, dot, dot as a shortcut, right? Because we realize that if n goes to infinity, all this stuff, as, as Hannah said earlier, will be so small that it won't matter. So it'll be like 54 n cubed over 6 n cubed. It's like these n cubes are going to negate each other and then just divide each other out. And we have 54 over 6. Which is 9. 9. Is 9. It's 12. 9 plus 3 is 12. So what does that number 12 mean? It's the limit. Area. The limit as n goes to infinity? Yeah. What does it mean in the context of the original problem that we started with? The area. The area of right the here. This, this shaded in pink area is 12. 12 squared? Just 12. Just 12. Well, 12 units squared, but okay. 12, 12 area units, whatever. 12 squares. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty, that's been amazing. We can, <laughs> with all this, like, if, if you took this, like, let's grab this calculator and wrap that function. Let's get it turn it on. Silly thing about this thing here. X squared plus, no, B squared plus one. Graph. So we were able to figure out squares can fit under that curve. This curve yeah. is like this, it's not even a shape that we know about areas for, like maybe if it was a circle or a triangle or a rectangle or a, a, a trapezoid or like any other parallelogram. parallelogram. You could probably, yeah, we could figure out some area for a rhombus. parallelogram. Break it into rectangles and triangles and stuff. A what? A rhombus. A rhombus. Probably about any polygon, we could figure out the area of a polygon using uh, splitting in triangles, one half base times height. But this is a this is a parabola. We know nothing about the area of a parabola except for now we do, right? And it, it comes out to an exact like a nice round number of twelve exactly twelve squares would fit inside there. Even though to do that you would have to like put a, a square right uh, right there. Okay, we can fit some squares there. Cut some up. And now like now we have to. Yeah, start cutting them up into pieces. And if we added up all those tiny little pieces, it comes out to exactly 12. And we know that for sure, because we used calculus. We used, actually, we didn't really even use any calculus. Yeah, I guess we're going to have to summation notations. Summation notations. Summation notations. So the next step is to learn how do we use calculus oh, no. to do this. No, no. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. That's really neat. Are you actually like genuinely amazed every day by what math does? I think it's cool. Yeah. I mean, I I think it's cool, but this is like only the second time you've done this. That so you've done in your life. Million you've probably done it forever. I I do. I genuinely do. When I think about it, when I take time to think about that, it is really amazing. And when I even you know when we're factoring polynomials and just finding x-intercepts and zeros of, of fourth degree polynomials, I think that's really cool. That's really really smart. But somebody thought to do that, and I'm really fortunate that I get to see it 
and I always like any time I can go from here to there, and like every step has its justification. It's absolutely true. In government, in, in uh, psychology, and even in, in lots of fields of science, you can't be 100% sure of these things. You can base it on evidence and uh, experiments and all that kind of stuff and say, well, everything tells us this has to be true. But then we find out like it's stuff lies. about light and the speed of light and wormholes and black holes and they exist but we don't know how to explain them exactly. We yeah, think we, we know everything about, about them. Black holes. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So if you, yeah. If you like from my freshman year when I had him, a bunch of like upperclassmen like if you guys don't want to do anything in the in the office, just ask them a couple questions about black holes and he will literally go on and black get Black holes and Godzilla. Yeah, talk about <laughs> 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 I'm not going to let you suck into this. So, uh, let's move on. Yeah, we're screaming people the whole time. Um, <laughs> you like this is fun. <laughs> yeah, and like <laughs> 30 minutes later, the class is still just waiting for him to come back. Okay, so um, I'm going to go on to 4.3. You're welcome to turn, like, if you think about it, you turn to 4.2 whenever you want, because there's no penalty for that. I would encourage you to do it now. To do 4.2 no, to, uh, to the point that it, you feel comfortable with it. The thing about 4.3 is it's like the same thing again, with some new information bridging the gap between. Uh, summation notation and calculus, actually using some calculus. Starting to bridge that gap, starting to. 4.4 will actually bridge the gap, but we're getting there. Right? 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 What? Yeah. I was just wondering, like, is this where the antiderivatives are going to come in? I was wondering why they're doing those. Really yes, the antiderivatives will be, will be the link. It is, if you will allow yourself to really think about it, Blow your mind. Oh, damn, wow, how it's amazing it is. Like if you sold me. Sounds like drugs. If you really think about <laughs> if, you, if you think about the, the first question, the tangent line question, like take a function like two x cubed plus five x squared minus two x plus seven. Okay? And I ask you, for any given x, tell me the the slope of the tangent line. Is that x value? That seems impossible. You know it's gonna be this this wavy function, it's a cubic function, and it was positive leading coefficient, so it's going to go like this. And then I, I'm telling you that I want you to tell me the, the slope of the tangent line for any x that I give you. Okay? That's weird, but that's a hard question to answer. And the fact that you can answer it by taking the exponent and multiplying for, for each of those terms, take the exponent and multiply it by the coefficient and subtract them from the exponent. Go on down the line and do that, and that's an equation that'll tell you the slope of the tangent line that it means the value of x. That's a that's pretty amazing. Uh, it seems very strange that that would work, and yet it does. So when we find out how calculus will tell us the area under the curve, is, well, and we're going to do an experiment to help us along, to help us believe it. Um, let me just lay out a little. No, I'm gonna let you do the experiment first. It's okay. Are we getting in our groups? Right now? Huh? Are we getting in our groups? Or? No, this experiment you'll do for homework. Oh, okay. okay. So our homework is just the experiment, or are you have homework? Uh, we'll go through. The experiment's easy. It's just collecting some data. Hey, I'm just like to be organized. Data, no problem. Just gotta take a car ride, collect some data, and you're done. Okay. I can't do that. You can't ride in a car. A car ride? Oh, oh. So um, <laughs> it's forbidden my religion. Okay. You can walk everywhere. So, <laughs> that is illegal, too. Let me. <gasps> Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, that's nice. Good luck trying to play with your brain. I've really mastered it. It's got some textured rubber at the bottom. Okay, so what I really want you to do in, in 
we're going to find areas again, we're gonna find the same way. We're gonna use different notation to tell you that that's the question, and we're gonna introduce this vocab of a Riemann sum, okay? Um, a, basically, a, a Riemann sum is, is what we've already done, is to split it up into, let's say, rectangles, yeah. We're gonna split it up into rectangles. But a Riemann sum, uh, you don't necessarily have to have equal widths of the rectangles. Okay? What? Now, the main thing that we want to be able to do with this is uh, talk about um, left-handed sums, right-handed sums, midpoint sums, upper uh, upper sum, lower sums, uh, all this kind of stuff. It's, it's really not that complicated. Okay? And all I want you to really get out of it is, is to be able to navigate your way through that vocab. If a, if a question were to ask you, uh, you know, use the given data to find the left-handed Riemann sum for, you know, this, this data, I want you to just know that means, okay? Um, and we'll get more into those, those trickier questions, but right now we'll, we'll make it pretty basic. If you want to, uh, find the area for this curve. And I want to find the right hand Riemann sum. That's what we do right now. That's how we imagine, that's how we envision finding the area under the curve with all those rectangles. Why do you think it's called the right hand sum and how is it what we already do? Right hand sum? The right side of the triangle. The right side of the rectangle. To, to decide the height of that rectangle. Mm -hmm. Right hand sum. All right. <laughs> so if we divide this into a what's called a partition, a partition is just a way of dividing up the whole thing into definite sub intervals. Okay. So this could be a partition. Here's a. There you go. There's a sub interval. There's another sub interval. Another sub interval. Here's another sub interval. Don't have to be. Now, you have to imagine, we don't know what it is, but there's some rule for deciding how wide each of these sub-intervals is going to be, okay? And then that rule has to allow you to have more and more rectangles. But as you have more and more rectangles, for the most part, all of these guys are going to get squished down to infinitely thin, right? Make sense? Yeah, okay. Uh, so a right-hand sum would be, well, I'll use this right side to decide how big this rectangle is, right side for this rectangle, right side for this rectangle, right side for this rectangle, right side, even though it makes it come underneath, uh, I'll use the right side and then I'll use the right side for that, for that rectangle. Quick question. Yep. So we can figure out the area from under the curve without calculus. Why are we adding calculus? What are we going to be able to find out that's different? You won't find new information, but it's kind of the difference between finding the, the slope of the tangent line or the derivative function with that limit definition. Okay. The limit as h goes to, let's see, as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. We did away with that a long time ago, and we learned these derivative rules. Yeah. The same thing here. Like, if I were to ask you to find the, the derivative of, of something that you would need like the chain rule for, it would be really tedious. But if we learn about how to find derivatives in alternate ways, if we learn about the chain rule, it becomes faster, it becomes easier, it becomes more possible, it opens up more possibilities. So what it will allow us to do is find the areas under curves for which that definition <laughs> would take a very, very long time. Okay, and it draws, it's gonna draw a connection between the area under the curve and actually the derivative. Um, okay, so what, what's a left-handed sum then? Use the left side. Use the left side of your subinterval to decide the height of the rectangle. Okay, uh, let's do that in a different color. Uh, green. Green. I like green. Okay. Okay. Left side. Left side. Left side. Left side. Left side. Left side. Almost. Left and we months up. Yes? Okay. What's
What's a midpoint sub? Is that, is that, we have a right hand sum and a left hand sum. What's the midpoint sum? Middle of the rectangle. Middle of the sub interval to the side of the rectangle. Okay, find the middle. The middle is the one that will tell us. Okay, middle right about there. Middle just sounds like it's so much harder to Yeah. I know. It's really more about vocab than it is about Actually, us using it. Oh, okay. In the middle of this one, would be that high. Right? Which one's most accurate? Like, if we're talking like a general amount of rectangles or not? Do you think generally one of them will be more accurate than any of the others? No. If you think you could draw a graph where, like, draw three different graphs, and each of them, the right hand sum is better, the other one, the left hand sum is better, and another one, the midpoint is better. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you bring it to infinity, it won't matter. That's the point about Riemann sums, <laughs> is that, or any sums of these rectangles, that if you take the number of rectangles to infinity, they'll all come up with the same thing. Okay? Right. Um, okay. Now, I just want you to keep this in mind. Right hand, left hand, midpoint. Just log it away. Like, put it in a special place in here, in, here, in your brain, okay? We'll do some AP questions uh, soon enough that we'll use this, this language and we'll, uh, they, yeah, they are, but we just wanna finalize it and, and make it official right now, yeah? Speaking of AP questions, yeah. uh, the, that one packet that you gave us, yeah. which was supposed to talk around on the yeah. internet, Ryan, there were the only ones that ever talked about it. Oh, that's true. I mean, we don't really need a homework test because these aren't, these aren't just trying to homework on these ones. Yeah, because yeah. I said I was leaving. That was some DC. Huh? That was some DC. We get a pull out of the bucket of the blocks. Ooh, yeah. It was from Andy. Well, we're just gonna. Like I'm gonna leave it up to you, it it. you to remind me of that when I can do something about it, <laughs> or decide to do something about it. Right now, we're gonna stay with this. Okay. Right hand, left hand, midpoint. So we have that packet. Oh. So the. Uh, the, like Hannah said, it's kind of self-explanatory, but we might as well talk about it, because if you saw that by yourself on the AP test, you certainly would say, what the heck is this? Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> okay. There's some like, technical words about a Riemann sum that I just I don't think we gained anything from. Okay? It basically comes down to what Brian said. No matter how you decide how wide the rectangles are, as long as your widest one, which we call the norm, the widest subinterval, as long as whatever rule you use to decide how wide that is causes it to go down to infinitely thin, it won't matter, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Because whatever rule is making this one pretty skinny, is making this one really wide, this one is probably our norm because it's the widest. As long as our norm goes to zero, the width of it goes to zero, this one will go to zero as well because the same rule controls the width of this subinterval. So, those are the basics of a, of a Riemann sum. You know what we're going to wind up doing? The exact same thing that we did in the previous section. Use a right-handed sum with equal sub-intervals. Equally with the digit rectangles. So what are we learning about this project? Just the official vocab of right-hand, left-hand sum, and Riemann sum. For the entire section, so we're doing this. Well, we're, we're also going to learn some notation. Okay. okay. Well, starting. To bring these two things together, yeah? What would you have to change about the function if you were to use like larger, smaller uh, sub sections of this? Sub equal. Sub equal. Sub 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 change about the function? Yeah. Would you have to change anything to like find the widths of them? Or would it be still like a, just a, like the A, the B minus A over N, would that still work for? It won't work to find subintervals that are not equal. That'll only work to find subintervals that are equal, but that'll be our default anyway. Okay. Okay. Would you repeat what the Riemann sum was? A Riemann sum is just it, it's it's a method of dividing it up into two rectangles, just like we've been doing, with, with possibly different widths. Oh. Maybe different. Maybe the same widths. Maybe different widths. But as long as the widest width, as you let there be more rectangles, as long as that whatever rule decides how wide that is 
makes this widest one go to a width of pretty much zero, okay. then we can just let the number of rectangles go to infinity, and that limit will be the area of the rectangle. How does it go to zero on the width? That part we could discuss, and I just feel like we don't get much out of it, because what we're going to wind up doing is not using unequal subintervals. We're going to use equal subintervals. Uh, so, Yeah, I mean, in the end, we could talk about it, and you could understand it a little better. You can read up on it. I mean, it talks about it in your book. Yeah. You talk about unequal subintervals. Yeah. But in the end, like, when you move on and actually find areas under curves, mm -hmm. it's just the easiest to use equal subintervals, yeah. to use b minus a over n. Why the did they of even create the some? Well, there's some that it works better for? No. <laughs> what we do is a Riemann sum. <laughs> it's a special case of a Riemann sum, where the subintervals okay. are equal. Is a Riemann sum, but Riemann sums allow for unequal subintervals. Is that kind of like that, like square and rectangle? They're weird relationships. Like one of the, like a square rectangle. A square is a rectangle. It fits the definition of a rectangle, but it, but a rectangle is not necessarily square. square. Yeah. Wow. A sum of the areas of a bunch of rectangles is a Riemann sum, but if you use a Riemann sum, it's not necessarily going to use. Um, okay, you can see right here after it talks about Riemann sums, it goes on to say, hey, you know what's really easy? Use equal subintervals. Use equal widths for all your rectangles. B minus A over N. Okay, so since it only takes like three sentences for them to go from, hey, here's these things that have maybe not equal subintervals, and then they say, you should use equal subintervals. I just feel like it's not what I'm trying to do. Okay. <coughs> um. okay, so what we get now is some different notation. If I tell you to uh, find the area under the curve for the area under the curve created by this function between x is 0 to 3. Okay. Okay. So uh, instead of all of that, this means the same thing. Okay. So it's like all the instructions are wrapped up in that notation. What does this mean to you right now? It means the antiderivative to you. And it's not a coincidence that we use it for area under the curve, right? And that's, that's the bridging the gap between summation notation and the calculus of it. We're not going to do that yet. Our experiment's going to help us understand that link. Because if I just told it to you now, you could do it. You could, you could find areas and really quickly. Um, <laughs> but you, you wouldn't get why. I saw this experiment on somebody else's syllabus, and I was like, that is great. That is perfect. So we're going to do that this year, and it's going to be perfect. Be right great. now? No. It's going to be your homework. Oh, the experiment. OK. OK. Um, so really all we're getting out of this is that we're going to do the same thing, find areas on the curves, but I'm telling you with a different notation. But we're There's more to it than that, but in the end, that's we're finding them the same way? Or we're finding them the same way. Same we're using limit way. notation. Limit as it goes to infinity. Blah, 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 all <coughs> this. So what makes that better than that? Like why? That? The point of using that. Well. If it's going to find them the same thing the same way. Um, and I guess for me, it gives us a little more time to find these areas to get used to this notation, meaning what it means. 
so that we don't just jump to the calculus and, and forget the link between the two things. Okay. Um, so this is the same thing as between, uh, I guess, from, yeah, from 0 to 3, the area of the curve from 0 to 3, and so is this the area of the curve from 0 to 3. Um, so let's do another one, right? Another area of problems together. Uh, so that's just a measure that we can solve. They haven't done anything yet. Yeah. But we don't even want to do this one here. We did this one. Yeah. So let's do another one with... Explanatory, but we should go through them. Um, so, what would you say? Since you now know this notation, what would you say that's equal to? Are those both A's? Yeah, they're both A's. Okay. They're so, they're both A's. numbers here, this, this is what we call the definite integral. When I put these numbers here, it means something slightly different. So what's the area of that? Zero. I want to find the area between three and three. There is no area there. That's, that's one property of the definite integral. Um, So we switch limits of integration, we just get the negative of that area. Um, if I were to take assuming that A is less than C, C is less than B, so C is between Can I shorten that up, do you think? Yeah. What? From A. Would be yeah. to A, or can I say from A to B? Yeah. So if I, I go from A to C, I add up all that area, then I just start right at C again and go all the way to B like this. Here's A, here's B, here's C. If I find all this area, that's what that is, and find all this area, that's what that is, and add it up, I just have the area from A to B. <coughs>
if what this represents is really just the cumulative sum of the area, and if, like to find this, we would use infinite sums. It would make sense that we could take this and add it or subtract it. one, if we have a constant multiple, and this, well, if you think about it, we're like, you know, put all this together into an infinite sum, we're going to do summation notation, the rules for summation notation take over, and what's really going to happen is we're going to take that constant multiple, and multiply it by the result of that infinite sum. So we're gonna find what are we gonna find? It's on our homework. And what do you want us to be doing? What? Uh, the area under the curve of three x squared on the interval of three, one to three. Let's draw a picture. What would this picture look like? Uh, really thin. Okay, kind of a thin parabola. Uh, three x squared like this. Let's say this is zero and. Zero. This is one, so we're gonna find this area. Yeah. So how do we find this area? Find the first. Not. Well, I 
Uh, B minus A over N, right? That's delta X or DX, right? Is what? 2 over N. 2 over N. B minus 1 is 2 over N. Okay. How about uh, we need X sub I? What's X sub I? Start right x sub i is the right side of a rectangle, so we're going to start at one. We'll start right there at one. That's a, and then we're going to go over by widths of the rectangle. So we're going to take one, we're going to move over, we're going to move over by width of the rectangle, two over n times i, however many rectangles we need to move over. Okay, so that's uh, one plus. plug that into the function to find the height, right? So 3 times 1 plus 2 over n times i squared, what's this? The height. What else do we need? The width, which is just 2 over n. Which is 2 over n. Separate them. Yeah. So this six over n is going to get multiplied by this that we're going to split apart into several different stuff. One plus four over n. We'll pull out that constant multiple of four over n. Plus four over n squared. formula on this, what will this be? N. N. 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 N times. Plus 4 over N times N. And N plus 1 over 2 plus 4 over N squared uh, times N times N plus 1 times 2 N plus 1 over 6. Make sure you keep all your parentheses straight, that the 6 over n is outside this entire parentheses, that kind of stuff. And now we've used the summation formulas, and so we can actually evaluate the limit and then goes to infinity. Uh, but first, let's distribute this in here and then like multiply these together. Okay? So here we'll get 6n over n plus, uh, let's see, 24 n times n plus 1 over n times n times 2, 2n squared, plus, we'll get 6 times 4, that'll be 24 times n times n plus 1, times 2n plus 1. Is that a 2n squared in the bottom? Is that compiler? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, oh, then I'll distribute this in. Here we get 6 and to the third. 
what will this approach as n goes to infinity? Six. Six. What will this approach as n goes to infinity? Twelve. Two. Oh. We'll have an n squared up there, right? We'll have a 24 n squared as our leading term. So 24 over 2, that would be 12. Plus. What will be the leading coefficient up here? 48. 24 times 2. Right? This will come out to be 24 n cubed. Blah, 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 blah. 24 over 6. Or sorry, 48. I just said it and then I didn't write it down. 48. So uh, 48 over 6. Eight. So twenty-six. Area under that curve is twenty-six. Six. Go us. Homework. Okay. First of all, I need you all to uh, take out a piece of paper. Yeah. Or get it on somebody else. More important than what the, the homework is full point is. Oh, this is not a This is their experiment, okay? So, what you're going to do is take a 20-minute car ride. Can we, do we have to have a complete weight and write the sound of it? Right. Can we write down those 20-minute car rides? Oh. Uh, no. Only write what I write. Oh, wait. Uh, if you have it, yeah, just pass it in. Uh, so you're going to take a 20 minute car ride. Split up into one minute intervals. Okay? This is like a function from 0 to 20, from 0 minutes to 20 minutes. Okay, split up into one minute intervals. Every one minute, I want you to be as accurate as you can possibly be. Maybe use a stopwatch or something. Okay? But. You're ready to take your car ride. You don't have to start from, from a sitting position. You can start the timer whenever. You're already going. It doesn't really matter, OK? Um, so, but I want you to just like make a table. And every minute, I want you to uh, write down. And I want you to be a passenger in this experiment, not the driver. Oh. Or have your passenger do it for you, okay. OK? But I don't want you driving and writing these down at the same time. Okay. So at one minute, I want you to write down how fast you're going. At two minutes, I want you to write down how fast you're going. Okay, so you got your time here, your speed, actually your velocity. What's the difference? That velocity gives direction. Yeah, so if you ever drive in reverse, I want you to make note of that. Maybe make it easier on yourself and always drive in forward <laughs> or be stopped. Okay? Uh, and then I just want some notes here about traffic, like we're, or where you are, if we're on the highway, or it's uh, it's bumper to bumper, we're in town. I would just suggest driving from Florence to Missoula. Okay. And so, like, if on the third minute you're on a stoplight, zero, zero. Okay. I just want to make sure that like, that doesn't mean you stop the no. timer until you. No, you don't stop the timer. You you keep it going. If you happen to just to start it and you're going two miles an hour, mark that down. Okay. Uh, or zero miles. An hour. Okay, also here, I want your odometer. Do you know what your odometer is? Yeah. How many miles your car has driven in its lifetime? Um, right, at the oh beginning, <laughs> beginning odometer, beginning odometer. And then at the end, I want your ending odometer. So you just want two? Beginning yep, <coughs> beginning and end. Okay, that's all I need you to do. Then, so that we can collect the data and I can have it in one place, I want you to enter it. I'll have links on the homework page. Okay? You have to go to the homework page anyway to find these links, so I'm just going to put the homework up later and you'll have it and I'll text it and it'll be all right. Okay? You got it? You got 4.2 turned in, 4.3, and this experiment, the experiment's real simple. You know, just write stuff down or have somebody else write it down for you. 